So we're going to do some more 1848 uh, revolutions, so springtime of nations, Mexican Revolution, and land reform. Okay, so those are the three focuses. Mexican Revolution, uh, 1848 revolutions, land reform. Okay, so Mexican Revolution. This happens in uh, 1910 and 1920, so it happens for 10 years, but there's sporadic fighting, and it's almost, they also call it a civil war. And so the, it almost seems like there's revolutionary fervor, there's spirit out there, but everybody's, it's just a, a pretty much an age of lawlessness. And so who's going to take over, you know, once the revolutionaries are successful? That's another important aspect to the revolution. So, yeah, get rid of the bums is one of the first part. But the next part is how do you put in a position, a system that is an effective system that works for, you know, everybody who's involved. Okay, so the Mexican Revolution, I'm going to call it the revolution because that's what a lot of people called it. And then later on, you'll actually get the Institutional Revolutionary Party, the PRI, who stays in the power for about 54 years, uh, from 1946 to the uh, general election of 2000. So the PRI, the Institutional Revolutionary Party, monopolized power for about 50-something years. And so it just goes to show you, this is also like Cuba. They have all these, the revolutionary committees, the committee to protect the revolution which are actual like watch committees that are just set up to kill anybody who might you know overthrow the government so it's basically anti-revolutionary committees but they're there to protect the uh, you know the revolution sort of like the society of the Cincinnati or the Sen society of the Cincinnati for America um Okay, so the revolution, the Mexican Revolution happens, uh, and you get the 1917 Mexican Constitution. So you get a constitutional revolution, and the Constitution is going to be the thing that actually lives for a long time. It's how they're able to get the uh, the Institutional Revolutionary Party adheres to the Constitution. And that's the rules to the game, so therefore uh, the rules go on to the game. There is a Cristero War of 1926 and 1929. It was a significant relapse into bloodshed. So there was some more bloodshed that happened in the late 1920s. So uh, even though it was 10 years of bloodshed, there was still more that would happen later on. Uh, the Constitution of 1917 is the first document in the world to set out social rights. Served as a model for the Weimar, uh, the Weimar Constitution, the, uh, the German Constitution, on the, after the First World War uh, of 1919, and then the Russian Constitution of 1918. Now that uh, it's interesting, I'd like to check out which Constitution they're talking about. But that's that was where Lenin made a mistake. Okay, uh, Stalin is clearly an evil, crappy guy. I don't think anybody that's universally known by everybody. Uh, but there's some, you know, people love Lenin and some people love Trotsky. And while I like their um, their idealism. I think by by taking a coup d'état, taking power by force, had basically made them illegitimate. That's why they had to fight all those civil wars long after that. If they would have given the provisionary government the necessary time and space to be able to come up with the reforms or maybe come up with an election where they could have elected the next serving power, then we could have actually done something. But instead, they took power by force. And then since they took power by force, then it's always been a totalitarian fascist system um, that, you know, has to de defend its bloodshed. It started out with bloodshed and it carried on with bloodshed. So that was, uh, that could have been the Russian constitution that we're talking about right here. So basically the Mexican constitution that they come up with were some, you know, they set out social rights, which is, you know, that's, that's relatively unheard of. We have individual rights, but not social rights. So, um... So yeah, they they modeled the Constitution out for the uh, Germany and for uh, 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 Russia. So they wrote this Mexican Constitution. They copied it, you know, across the world. And um, and so the effects of the Mexican Revolution is that it led to the creation of the Partido Nacional Revolucionary, the National Revolutionary Party in 1929. Then they renamed themselves the Institutional Revolutionary Party. And then under a variety of leaders, they were leaders. They were able to monopolize power until the general election of 2000. So for about 50, maybe 60, 70 years, you had this one political party that hold, held the power in Mexico. So that's that's not revolutionary. That's totalitarian. That's very Stalinist. And that's interesting because uh, Trotsky winds up getting killed in Mexico. So I understand the uh, the distinctions of the Trotskyists and the Leninists and all the rest of them. But I reject all of those guys. All those Russian revolutionaries aren't good enough for me. Um, I'm a, uh, I, I guess if I had to pick somebody, I would, uh, I, I like Marx, Karl Marx is a cool guy. All he did was write the ideas on paper and he says, workers unite, let's break our chains and let's all unite.
And that's all he said. And because he wrote those words, you had the revolutions of 1848. Um, they just burst out all across Europe. Um, and so this was, you know, this was about 100 years or maybe 70 years before the Mexican Revolution. So you have all these revolutions in Europe that was happening in 1848. And then you had people that came over here. It would be interesting actually to check out Trotsky. So, and, and you should, everybody should know about the, the Bolshevik Revolution, Lenin and Stalin and Trotsky. They were all together, right? They're all friends. It, I mean, actually, I was looking up Jean Jacques Rousseau. He was there with Diderot and Voltaire. And all these guys were like friends. And I mean, that could you imagine being in those circle of friends, those groups of people? So, the, that's amazing. People should definitely, you know, um, popularize that. But Trotsky, um, Trotsky was a jerk, man. Like, he basically turns against Stalin and was like, you know, you, you killed the revolution. It was all because of you. Uh, but he killed a lot of people in the Civil War. So they took over the Soviet Union. During, okay, there's a big war that's going on, World War One, And then the Bolsheviks had rose to power because they took the power. And so there was one revolution that kicked out the czars. And then once they had kicked it out, there was provisionary government figuring stuff out. I think this is a really rough sketch, so if I get any small details, you know, forgive me. But they um, they take the power and they say, we're going to run things our way. We're the communists, we're the dictatorship of the proletariat, and we're going to institute all these communist re reforms from, from the top down. And so government's a tool. Remember when I was saying government was a tool? They had just made it like an oppressive thing, though, as a nation state, so therefore they can make all the decisions. And so they became totalitarian, just like Hitler. And they were totalitarian for their communist ideals. So they were just putting a banner under all their, you know, it was still it was the power of the state, police state. It was a prison system, do as we say, or else, you know, that was it. And so they forced all these supposed communist ideas, which is a bastardization of communism and socialism. But they put all these communist ideas where they were forcing farm collectives. Everybody was working on a farm together, and then everybody was having a doled out a certain amount. So basically there was these long lines of people trying to get shoes because only everybody could only have one pair of shoes. Now everybody could only have so much food, so therefore they had to dole them out in equal portions, and then there wasn't actually enough for everybody to go around. So the government running all the um, tenets of capitalistic sort of structures had failed. So they tried to run the entire government, and even though it was good for their, um, you know, their individual, their private wealth in terms of the country itself, it didn't, it didn't, it, it failed. It was a really bad failed experiment, and that's unfortunate. Um, and because they had such high hopes, and in fact, when they had great power, they thought that they were going to inspire revolutions all over the world, including in America, and then Woodrow Wilson had the Red Scare, and that's when you get the rise of J. Edgar Hoover and uh, Mitchell Palmer, I think J. Mitchell Palmer, so J. Edgar Hoover, J. Mitchell Palmer, I think <laughs> they're both J's, but the, uh, they, that was the first sort of uh, repression by the Americans uh, against their own people because they didn't want the American people to go Bolshevik and go Russian and go Germans and all these revolutions was happening, you know, in uh, in Europe during this World War One. But Woodrow Wilson he had outlawed, you know, uh, talking bad about the war, so everybody was all behind the war effort. And uh, Eugene Debs he goes to jail for about ten years, and um, and everybody they rounded up in the Red Scare turned out to be. Not communist, you know, conspirers. So basically it was a red scare over nothing. McCarthyism is pointing out all these communists. And we're just not, you know, it's just not like that. It's almost as if, like, I don't know, anybody that would just be, I mean, I looked at communism and I considered it or whatever, but anybody that would sort of just be like, it almost seems like you'd be saying it just to counter what the other people are saying. So to be fo so for certain, you know, that that is a better system. I see a mixed system, which is sort of what we have right now in America. We have a mixed social system where there's um, food stamps and Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, things like that. Uh, but you also have to go out and work. So it's a mixed system. There's enough social net that seems to be helping a lot of the majority of the folks or should be. And where it's not, we need to make those things better. But the um, it's also capitalistic to where you have to go out and make your own thing. And uh, that's Rand Paul. He says the engine of capitalism is the reason why we were able to uh, last longer than the Soviet Union. And so that's another thing. The Soviet Union was against America for about like three decades with the Cold War, saying their lifestyle was better. Um, and then we said ours was, and then their whole uh, economic system had collapsed from underneath them. Ronald Reagan takes credit, and here we are today. <laughs> uh, so that was a quick fast-forwarding of it. But um, I think it's fascinating because actually the revolution in uh, Mexico happens in 1910 and 19. 
seventeen, and he when does he die? So see that's he basically the revolution happens in um, Mexico the same time that the revolutions are happening in Europe because their constitution actually was used in Germany and in Russia. So Mexican's constitution, or the Constitution of Mexican of uh, Mexico of nineteen. 17 is used in the Weimar Weimar Republic report the 18 1918 the Weimar Republic of Germany and then the Russian Constitution of 1918 um, and so that's that's amazing that's I mean, that's that's absolutely incredible <laughs> so Leon Trotsky I wanted to find out when he had uh, when he had died assassination final months so it was May 1940. So this is way beyond the revolutions, but they had revolutions in Mexico, so I bet they did love Trotsky because all the ideas Mexicans were listening to the ideas, but somehow the ideas just didn't penetrate the uh, the, the American psyche. But May 24th, 1940, Trotsky survived a raid on his home by armed Stalin assassins led by GPU agent Lucif Grigorovich, Mexican painter and Stalinist David Alfaro, Sequeros, and Svidal. Trotsky was attacked August 20th, 1940, in his home in Mexico with a mountaineer's ice axe. An ice pick. A mountaineer's ice axe. So one of them, an ice axe. By undercover NKVD agent Ramon Mercator. So he was attacked in his home in Mexico. He was in Mexico in 1940. The blow to Trotsky's head was poorly delivered and failed to kill Trotsky instantly as... Mercado had intended witnesses stated that Trotsky spat on Mercado and began struggling fiercely with him. Hearing the commotion, Trotsky's bodyguards burst into the room and nearly killed Mercator, but Trotsky stopped them, laboriously stating that the assassin should be made to answer questions. Trotsky was taken to a hospital, operated on, survived for more than a day, dying at the age of 60, August 21st, 1940, as a result of blood loss and shock. Mercator later testified at his trial. I laid my raincoat on the table in such a way as to be able to remove the ice axe, which was in the pocket. I decided not to miss the wonderful opportunity that presented itself. The moment Trotsky began reading the article, he gave me my chance. I took out the ice axe from the raincoat, gripped it with my hand, and with my eyes closed, dealt him a terrible blow on the head. So Trotsky's last words, they said, according to James P. Cannon, Secretary of the Social Workers Party, um, where I will not survive this attack, Stalin has finally accomplished the task he attempted unsuccessfully before. So I will not survive. He succeeded in killing Trotsky. And so I don't. What sucks? Violent revolutions are bad revolutions. I will never change that notion. Okay, that I will never change that. Um, the, the, I do wonder sometimes though, because so, Stalin took out Trotsky, and out of the three. Lenin, Trotsky, and Stalin. I think I'm more sympathetic to Trotsky. I, I do. Because I feel like he's more of a theorist. He was more, um, I don't know. It just seemed like he was better carrier of the re revolution than sort of the other two were. Lenin died young. You know what was that about. But that could have been a Stalin poisoning. Right? And uh, Stalin was just a total jerk. He just totally bastardized the entire revolution. And so... Um, out of the three, I think I like Trotsky. He's way better character than Stalin, easily, right? Um, but also, he, you know, he kills him, and that's the problem with like violence against your heroes because it actually shuts them up and it stops them from doing the work that they want to do. Martin Luther King, we haven't been to the Promised Land yet, so we never got to the. So the assassination of Martin Luther King was effective at stopping that would-be inevitable revolution. And um, no, Barack Obama is not the dream of Martin Luther King. The dream of Martin Luther King was a better society where black and whites could walk hand in hand and where we all were happy. Sort of a socialist Christian wonderland where, you know, poverty had been cured and we were a war society. You know, capitalism, uh, materialism, right? Then uh, 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 the war machine. There's three heads that uh, Martin Luther King said we needed to destroy, and one of them was materialism, and then the other one was sort of the war machine, the uh, uh, and racism. That was the three ugly heads. So there was there was materialism, racism, and I don't know the war machine. That's uh, that's the simple one. But I'm actually going to keep on going because I have a good uh, idea of where I want this conversation to go. So Mexican Revolution. We're going to carry on Mexican Revolution, Homestead Act, and the revolutions of 1848. The Mexican Revolutions 
Um, and hopefully this gives out, uh, maybe it might be 30 minutes instead of 15. But the Mexican Revolution, we get the constitutions which are going to be used in Germany and in Russia. We get um, a revolutionary institutionalized political party that stays in power for decades. So they use the bloody revolution as their moniker forever and forever. Um, at the very end, I wanted to see the uh, the agrarian land reform. Okay, so there was land reform that had happened under poor fear. Uh, see, poor Fieriato, Rural peasants suffered the most. The regime confiscated large sections of land, which caused a major loss by the agrarian workforce. In 1883, a new land law was passed that gave ownership of more than 27.5 million hectares hectares of land to foreign companies. So there's a land reform, but it's given to all these companies. By 1894, one out of every five acres of Mexican land was owned by a foreign interest. Many wealthy families also owned huge estates, resulting in landless rural peasants working on the property as virtual slaves. In 1910, at the beginning of the revolution, about half of the rural population lived and worked on such plantations. This rapid and brutal Uprooting of the peasantry contributed greatly to the fury unleashed in the Mexican Revolution and its subsequent course, giving it the character of a gigantic peasant war for land that attacked the structure of the Mexican state. So, Salvador Alvarado, after taking control of the Yucatan in 1915, organized a large socialist party and carried out extensive land reform. The landed, uh, large landed estates were confiscated and then land was redistributed to the liberated peasants. So the revolution saw land reform. Land reform happened. So that's a major, you know, there's, it's bloody, right? So this isn't a very good example, but we're seeing the specific elements that come out of these revolutions that we can compare and contrast with other revolutions. This is world re revolutions, okay? So these are re revolutions that have happened throughout the world. And in the Mexican Revolution, we see land reform. So land reform, we're going to see just like in Lincoln's Revolution. I think that's fair to say the Civil War is a revolution, a bloody revolution. In Lincoln's Revolution, we see land reform had come out of it, too. So that changes the course of American history for a long time. It was probably the biggest giveaway that the American uh, government has ever given to the American people. And it was 160 acres a pop, you know, 160 acres. And in some aspects, it turned out to be 640 acres. So anybody who could fill out an application and could f pay the fee and would promise to protect the land that they had took over or that the government gave to them, they had, you know, 160 acres free free of charge. You didn't have to pay taxes on it. You know, they wanted you to develop the land, to live on it, to give more citizens, to make them more powerful. And at the time, they were fighting a war, so they wanted more people to fight for the Union side. They wanted more Unionists and Americans and less Confederates. So they was actually looking to drive... Um, lots of things, not just um, baby making, right? So they're cre creating baby making machines at the same time by having land reform. And those are those new babies are going to be voters, right? And they they might vote Republican, and they'll always remember what Lincoln did for them, and they'll always be Republicans because of what Lincoln did for them. So that was uh, Lincoln did that in the um, Civil War, the Revolution, right, uh, uh, of America. But then also you have this guy. Salvador Alvarado, um, he took control of the Yucatan and he organized a large socialist party and they carried out extensive land reform. So they did it too. Um, earlier though, they had some sort of uh, land reform that did not work out very well in the 1880s and 1890s since you had basically full, a lot of foreigners who owned the land and none of them owned any land. So they either there was rich people that owned a bunch of land, rich Mexicans that owned a bunch of land, and there's the poor peasants that have no land whatsoever, or there's foreigners you know, lots of gringos that was owning the uh, the gas stations in Mexico, and that made them all mad. So the role of the United States, and then the role of the Catholic Church, and then the legacy. Okay, we're going to finish the Mexican Revolution up. And this is just Wikipedia. I'm reading Wikipedia. But I'm saying it out loud, so for people that, you know, I don't know. I like articulating it myself anyways. So the first time the United States became involved in the revolution was in 1914 during the Uparanga incident. When the United States intelligence agents discovered the German merchant ship. Yeah, actually, so the United States gets into the World War into World War One because of the Zimmerman telegram. So they're in chaos. They're fighting this, um, you know, the, the revolution between 1910 and 1920. At the same time, we're fighting a world war. And so Woodrow Wilson was afraid that these revolution, uh, revolutionary ideas might spread to the United States. I mean, there's revolutions that's happened in Germany and in Russia and, and Mexico. Did it get to the American people? 
Um, I, evidently not, because there wasn't uh, nothing significant really happened under Woodrow Wilson's watch. He got to fight the World, uh, World War One, and um, you know he peacefully left office and gave it to. He was known as a progressive, right? They they put him under the banner of the progressive era, and he was a racist, a segregationist. He was in, uh, thought that the birth of a nation was writing history with lightning. He was, uh, you know, he, he segregated his cabinet and his uh, the the White House. And just other stuff. So uh, he he segregated the armed forces. So he was a bad guy. He was uh, against German nationalism or German Americans or Irish Americans. He was the only Americans, right? No, no. We have this rich history. Actually, Woodrow Wilson killed the German American movements. Woodrow Wilson killed the Irish American movements. There are no people today that I know of that talk about being a German American. And I think it's all because of Woodrow Wilson. Woodrow Wilson stopped that. When we were fighting a war against Germany, you're not allowed to be German. You're not allowed to speak that ugly German tongue and talk about the German ways of life. This is America. You know, gosh darn it, and you better talk American, gosh darn it. Anyways, uh, the Mexican Revolution. So the first time the United States became involved in the revolution was in 1914. During the Yurpurang incident, the United States intelligence agents discovered that the German merchant ship, the Yurpuranga, was carrying illegal arms to Herta. President Wilson ordered troops to the port of Veracruz to stop the ship from docking. So he goes and invades Mexico. He did not declare war on Mexico, so we're just using it to stop you know, this is our backyard. We're allowed to use the land to stop anybody else from sending uh, weapons. So the United States forces in skirmish with Herta's troops in Veracruz. Herta. Herta. The Yurparanga managed to dock at another port. Infuriated Wilson, the ABC powers arbitrated and U.S. troops left American soil, but the incident added to already tense American-Mexican relations. In 1916, retaliation for the Pancha Villa's raid in Columbus, New Mexico, and the death of 16 United States citizens, President Wilson sent command, uh, sent forces commanded by Brigadier General John J. Pershing in New Mexico to capture Villa. So, Pancha Villa. So, we're part of the revolution. We're fighting against the revolutionaries, which is always, you know, we failed with the French Revolution. We failed with the ha Haitian Revolution. It seems like whenever there's a revolution going on in the world, it pays in dividends to support those who are on the side of freedom and democracy and for the good things. Because if you lose that fight, you were the, the, the British. You were the Redcoats. You were supporting the established people that was supporting all this horrible, you know, violence and bloodshed and, and you know, just just crappy society, right? So you are the Redcoats. When you don't support, you know, it's one thing to be neutral, but to support these, you know, brutal dictatorship. The uh, Iran-Contra, you had Oliver North in the media that was sitting there talking about um, how he's mad about this, you know, Burdell guy or whatever, who was, um, you know, probably deserted his post, and then you get like six people who had died. And um, uh, But he had he actually... You know, sold missiles to Iran, and then with that money, right, to give money, give the weapons to the enemy, um, and then with that money, he was able to finance these coke, um, you know, and fueled up uh, coke fueled uh, death squads, these jungle death squads. So they would just be into cocaine and just killing everybody for United Fruits for these corporations that wanted the land. That's where it all started. So you know, the the fact that that is our legacy. Sometimes we'll do like 10 to 20 bad things, but there was when we got rid of um, uh, Papa Doc. But another part about Papa Doc was that he controlled Haiti, and he controlled it, you know, unanimously. It was definitely his. There was nothing that anybody could do, but he wound up killing like 30,000 people, right? Just a lot of people was disappearing under his regime. Um, and he was a total totalitarian dictator. So I think that was like a good thing to help our PR just in the area. So sometimes American forces can do good things, but when and typically most Americans think of themselves as the good guys. We're the GI Joes. When we get there, we save the day, right? So sometimes we make a mistake here and there. Sometimes there's a little torture. Sometimes a kid gets blown up. But for the most part, America is there to save the day. Um, but unfortunately, the the historical, you know, all these incidents don't show it, especially the history of revolutions. We don't seem to be supporting those that are on the side of, you know, freedom and democracy. So we were part of the Mexican Revolution, but we were, um, you know, first we invaded with them without asking them. And then we sent forces down there to capture Villa. So we, we're, we're in the middle of this, right? So Ponce Villa is deeply entrenched in the mountains of 
Northern Mexico knew the terrain too well to be captured. Pershing was forced to abandon the mission and return to the U.S. This event, however, further damaged the already strained U.S.-Mexico relationship and causes Mexico's anti-United States sentiment to grow stronger. Um, so that, that happened, right, in Mexico. There's also the Zimmerman telegraph that the Germans had sent to Mexico saying to invade. If they invaded the United States, then the Germans would actually side with the Mexicans and they would declare war on the United States together. So that was an ingenious plan, right? Talk about getting uh, Mexicans their, their lost land that they had got. And you can get your lost land and side with Germany. And so really it feels like War I was just a big global empire fight between the Germans and the, the Brits and, you know, the Austrian hunger. Like, that, that whole, um, that entire empire is wiped out, right? The, the Austrian Hungarians? Or was that the, the Turkish Empire? I don't know. One of the empires was just wiped out because of the World War One, And that's a bloody revolution, too. So after World War One, World War Two, there was, you know, so it almost seems as though there's soft revolutions and hard revolutions. The hard revolutions is just a nice way to say bloody revolutions. But the soft revolutions can have just as big a deeper effect, like a change in leadership or a change in constitution, whereas a large or a, a hard revolution is a bloody revolution where they, you know, they could change the constitution and leadership and they change a lot of things about it, but because they were, you know, instituted in blood, then that makes their legitimacy actually not so strong. I don't know. Um, we're past the age of revolution, so I think we'll still look back on the revolutionary times with some sort of nostalgia, but really it seems like the whole thing is unnecessary. But, okay, carry on. The, uh, the Mexican government, the Mexican Revolution, they did get land reform just like American Homestead Act had did, um, which we're going to get into. But in revolutions of 1848, we're going to get into a, <laughs> in a second... Um, yeah, we'll just do it right now. I was going to roll the Catholic Church, and then the youth was in the revolution, and I was going to do Mexican Revolution. The legacy is a mix between scholars. Marxist claims it was a workers' revolution betrayed by the government bureaucratic class that never wanted reforms to begin with. So Marxist claims that it began as a workers' revolution, but it was betrayed by the government bureaucratic class that never wanted reforms to begin with. They believed that the regime was Bonaparist. Bonapartist, meaning it was uh, co-opted by other forces, right? Napoleonic, um, not the workers who fought for it, and it ended up being a political rather than a social revolution. So political revolution is just a change in leadership that could have got, you know, accomplished just with an election. Uh, functionists argue that it was essentially an inevitable occurrence, citing that it was a collapsing civil society and a government elite that was unable to reform itself. The old Porfirian system was bound to collapse and some forces want to improve upon the old system or replace it. There's even debate on whether it was a civil war or a revolution or a combination of the two. The old Porfirian system was moved and replaced with a new dynamic system that rooted, rotated leadership and appealed to multiple social groups yet still operated on similar foundations. The old Diaz regime was pre replaced with a younger, more da dynamic leadership representing different national interests, one able to monopolize mobilized popular support but still maintain stability and controls commonly agreed the new government was largely populist only for political stability this is evident in post-revolutionary rule of the PNR now the PNI and the PNI still exists today here's a monument to the revolution and so they have a big monument right so all all love and glory to the great Workers' revolution that eventually got co-opted by the bureaucrats and nothing like that. Which uh, land reform had happened, but we didn't see land. So the Mexican Revolution had land reform, but the American Revolution, we didn't see land reform. Lincoln's revolution, his bloody revolution, we saw land reform in the 1862 Homestead Act. The PRI is big in Mexico. Just know that they had, they had power for a long time and then they didn't have power. But they're trying to get back in. And so there's still a political power that's sort of, I don't know, it's going to take a while to actually, if they ever do truly die, you know, they might just stick around forever. Now, the revolutions of 1848, also known as the springtime of nations. This is a, the, the biggest thing I pull out of this was the, 
intellectual classes, those who control Occupy and the intellectual thought of what Occupy is, was unable to convince the working class peoples. Now, I see myself in both spheres, okay? As a working class person, I felt as though the intellectuals were much, very much like the professors lording over everybody, talking in an arrogant tone, pretending they had a monopoly on the truth and what was real and what was going on, not listening to anybody, not caring about consensus-based democracy, and basically selling the revolution out. So they might have cared at one time, but at that time they just wanted the power. And this is even the sort of the anarchist. Um, you know, I voted down, I twinkled down, but they didn't care because they wanted to cut the discussion out, get the people, quit talking because we're wasting time with all your stupid opinions, and we just want to implement the ideas that we think is best. And so they tried to take over, and then, um, you know, nobody likes that. you got to be a part of the, of the machine. Um, as a theorist or whatever, I was not in a good position to where I could have, been more, you know, uh, wanting to try new conversations and try new relationships. I felt as like I was a working class person, very much how I've been feeling for a while, um, just several decades or maybe uh, 15 years or so. Uh, but basically, you're a working class person. It's just you out here, and uh, you have to do what you got to do in order to get by, do the dishes, wash the dishes, you know, whatever it takes. And um, and that's it. So it's not so much. Uh, it's a more realistic thing, you know. There's there is no solidarity. Whenever I go into a place, I'm like, hey, we should unionize, and then you know, that's all just silly talk. Um, it never happens. It never gets off the ground. People aren't serious about it, and yet it would work. It would absolutely work if people actually had some loyalty towards one another. Okay, so revolutions of 1848. Um, it was uh, let's see, also known in some countries as the spring. Time of the peoples, or springtime of nations, or the spring of nations, or the year of revolution. The series of political upheavals throughout Europe in 1848 remains the most widespread revolutionary wave in European history. Okay, so they tried to actually change the government, structural, institutional change. Unlike Occupy, Occupy changed the conversation, but it wasn't an actual attempt at revolution, or at attempt at actually getting any type of power or influence, really. <laughs> Um, sleeping in a tent, at the very least, I was wanting to get a change in political culture. Maybe we could treat each other as equals. And even Carl, who had uh, basically took over the whole thing, um, didn't want to do it that way. And so I got burned out on it. I got burned out. I went to the meeting basically three times with ten ideas, and none of the ideas were ever discussed. And they were happy with that because they didn't want to incorporate anybody else's ideas. It was only about what they wanted to do. And then they would sit there and arrogantly talk about, well, sometimes people just want to do this and do that and don't ever. No, I, I wrote the letter. I wrote the article, and they didn't give a damn. You know, they didn't, whatever. I'm not going to complain about Occupy the whole time. But I did the work and it just felt like I was uh, being laughed at because I was actually doing the stuff that he had wanted me to do. And he wanted establishment writers instead of actual revolutionary writers on the ground and changing the how. So it wasn't consensus-based democracy. We weren't being treated as equals. We were definitely a hierarchical situation. And he couldn't listen to anybody else except for himself. And so the whole thing collapsed. Um... So yeah, okay, they, 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 we can learn a lot from the 1848 revolutions, okay? Occupy Louisville, the whole Occupy movement probably had very similar change. Louisville can brag about having the tents encampment up for the longest period of time, but that was totally happenstance, and it had to do with a lawyer that was basically sticking them to the grind. So there was a, a good lawyer that was actually in there, and I wish I would have gotten more conversations with this man. So, okay. The revolutionary wave began in France in February, immediately spread to most of Europe and parts of Latin America. So this happens, the revolutions of 1848 happens all over the, the whole world. Okay, the revolutionary wave began in France in February. Okay, so we, that's important. Okay, the uh, parts of Latin America, over 50 countries were affected. 50 countries! But with no coordination or cooperation among the revolutionaries in different countries. Five factors. So basically it was just an explosion of revolutionary activity in about the same general time for about similar reasons, but not coordinated. So this is what we're seeing with the Arab Spring. This is what we're seeing with the Tea Party-ish kind of, and the Occupy. Okay, so we put all that together, we were seeing the revolutions of 1848. Uh, five factors were involved. Widespread dissatisfaction with the political leadership. The Egyptian Revolution was all about getting Mubarak out, okay? That's all they cared about, just kick him out. That's all, that's all we can, just get him out. We don't care about anything else. We just want him gone. We just hate this regime so much, we don't want to ever see him ever again. Get him out of here. Get him out of here. And then he was put in a cage. 
And so that makes me think of the French Revolution, where they, you know, they, that's embarrassing. He used to be the king, and now he's in a cage, but he still lives. So it wasn't the French, it wasn't bloody, and said, this is the end, right? They allowed him to speak, and they allowed him to live. So it wasn't a clear departure from the past into the future. And in fact, the military has regained power today, and so there is no revolution in Egypt. The whole experiment had failed. And the military dictator who had, you know, been calling the shots behind the whole scenes has all the power today, right now, in Egypt. And Egypt's had several revolutions and land reform. So, okay. Revolutionary wave began in France in February, immediately spread in most of Europe and parts of Latin America, where 50 countries were... Let's see, the five factors was widespread dissatisfaction of political leadership's demand for more participation in government and democracy. It said, which of those are very good demands. Okay, we want more, uh, uh, you know, no taxation without representation. We want to be represented in government, and we want to have a choice in those who lead over us. Demands of the working classes: we're poor, we're hungry. Give us, you know, um, some uh, housing. Uh, upsurge of nationalism. So we're Germans. We're the, are we not Germans or are we not? Are we French or aren't we French? Finally, the regrouping of the reactionary forces based on the royalty, aristocracy, the army, and the peasants. So think about those four again, okay? The regrouping of the reactionary forces. So the revolutions of 1848 fail. They don't get any sort of structural change whatsoever. They failed, okay? They absolutely failed. They lost. And the reason why they lost is because of all this, but the biggest one, they regrouped. The reactionary forces, the anti-revolutionary forces, the royalty, the monarchy, the government, the aristocracy, the rich people that fund. So, okay, these are all the similar things we can see in our own society. We see the royalty, right? We don't have a monarchy, but we have, um, you know, we have presidents and governors and mayors. We also have the aristocracy, the rich people behind, you know, these people are actually financing it all. The army and the peasants. So you had the, the, the armed forces, you had gun people, and then you had poor people. Poor people that was fighting against their own self-interest because the intellectuals had failed to convince poor people that the revolution would benefit them. And how could they, you know, how could they fail in that conversation? And maybe because the conversation is they would fail. You know, the rich people in the ivory tower, they want to play with poor people's lives as if, like, they're cannon fodder when actually they're, they're the ones on the front line, okay? They're the ones on the front line in the Fran French Revolution. They're, they're in the front lines of every real, I guess, bloody conflict that you have out there. There's always, like, some corrupted leader that's pushing all these poor people out to die. So the revolutions of 1848. Those are the five factors that were involved. Widespread dissatisfaction with the political leader. A lot of the similar things we see today, okay, right? We want more democracy. We're sick of our political leadership. Nationalists, we're all the same, right? The Rainbow uh, Rebellion. Demands of the working classes. We need, you know, better jobs out here and uh, uh, some land reform. Uh, get us some income. The regrouping of the reactionary forces based on the royalty aristocracy. So we see that too. We see the reactionary forces. And that's also something you have to expect. You have to see that coming. So when the revolution happens, it's got to go for the jugular. It's got to go for the throat. Because if they don't actually get the revolution, you'll get the reactionary forces that will push the revolution out and back for so long. So if you look at Chile, Chile you had uh, Salvador Allende who had got assassinated. And then Chile never saw socialism at all. For 30 years they had a totalitarian form of capitalism. We will be capitalistic. We will invest in free enterprise whether you like it, like it or not. And we will do so by, the, by, by gunpoint. And that's just how we roll. So the 1848 revolutions, um, they were, the uprisings were led by shaky ad hoc coalitions, people that just got together, middle classes, workers, uh, they did not hold together for long, tens of thousands of people were killed, many more forced into exile, these only significant lasting reforms were the abolition of serfdom in Austria and Hungary. So serfdom was abandoned or, or created illegal. So slavery in Austria and Hungary were wiped out. So there were some good things. The end of absolute monarchy in Denmark, which is a good thing. Definitive end of the Capetian monarchy in France, another good thing. Revolutions were most important in France, Germany, Poland, Italy, Austrian Empire, but it did not reach Russia, uh, Sweden, Great Britain, and most of the southern Europe. Spain, Serbia, Greece, Montenegro, Portugal, and Ottoman Empire. So it spread for, through a lot of spots, but it didn't get everywhere. Uh, some of the, it got to Brazil. We see some countries in Brazil, New Granada. It happened in New Granada, other English-speaking lands. Belgium, Ireland, Danube, Greater Poland, Western Ukraine, Switzerland, Hungary, Hopsbury, 
uh, the Habsburg Empire, Schleswig, Denmark, Germany, and Italy and France. Other English-speaking lands in Britain, the middle classes had been pacified by general enfranchisement in the Reform Act of 1832. The consequent agitations, violence, and petitions of the Chartist movement came to a head with their peaceful petition in the Parliament of 1848. The repeal of 1846 of the protectionist agricultural tariffs called the Corn Laws diffused some proletarian fervor. The revolutions had little impact on the British colonies aside from a modest influx of immigration from German-speaking lands. So Germans were running away, <laughs> getting, the, getting the hell out of Dodge, getting away from the damn Prussians. So in the United States, the main impact of the revolutions or failure was substantially increased immigration, especially from Germany. This in turn fueled the nativist know-nothing movement preceding the American Civil War. So it showed how far the racist white people, the white Anglo-Saxon Protestants of America were going to be, and they were going to be against Germans and Irish and anybody else that weren't exactly Puritan and Anglo-Saxon as they were. The no nothings were opposed to immigration, especially immigration of German and Irish Catholics and held the Pope Pius IX responsibility, responsible for the 1848 revolution's failure. So they blamed Pope Pius IX. For some reason, they're saying that the German and Irish people have blamed Pope Pius IX, which is why. Why, what did Pope Pius IX have to do? Was the Catholic Church against these revolutions? It wouldn't be surprising. Um, they killed the uh, Francisco Fair. They was against Jean Jacques Rousseau. The legacy and the me the memory. There are multiple memories of the revolutions. Democrats looked to the 1848 as a democratic revolution, which in the long run ensured liberty, liberty, equality, and fraternity. Marxists denounced 1848 as a betrayal of working class ideals by a bourgeoisie indifferent to the legitimate demands of the proletariat. That's Occupy, okay? There's uh, lots of things that's happening and people want to see the glory of revolution and I think you can do both. Take the glory but also make sure there's real change. And if you're not doing real change, if you don't have a system that is actually sort of getting the best ideas out there and moving forward and making good, you know, at the very least what we would have gained if we were able to actually do consensus-based democracy, Occupy Louisville, is we would have been able to gain a different way of talking to each other. An equal relationship where we all respected each other's sovereignty. And if we could change how we talk to each other, that would be revolutionary on its face, on the beginning. And that would be a foundation from which to build off of. But we weren't able to do that. And so since we weren't able to do that, then we weren't doing any real big structural institutional changes. The, we were wasting our time and everybody else's time, too, that had believed in us um, to begin with. So in the post-revolutionary decade after 1848, little had visibly changed. Most historians considered the revolutions a failure, given the, the lack of permanent structural changes. Nevertheless, there are a few immediate successes for some revolutionary movements. Notably, in the Habsburg lands, Austria and Prussia eliminated feudalism by 1850. So Austria, Prussia, no more feudalism. Feudalism dead and gone. So the 1848 revolutions had that effect. They improved a lot of the peasants. European middle classes made political and economic gains over the next 20 years. France retained universal male suffrage. Russia would later free the serfs in 1861. The Habsburgs, uh, Habsburgs finally had to give to the Hungarians more self-determination and the Augsleks in 1867. The revolutions inspired long-lasting reform in Denmark as well as in the uh, Netherlands. In Chile, the 1848 revolutions inspired the 1851 Chilean Revolution. Okay, so it even hits Chile and it hit um, uh, Brazil too. So that's the, le the, lo the lasting and le or the long-lasting legacy. New Grenada, Spanish Latin America, the revolution appeared in New Granada, where Colombian students, liberals, and intellectuals demanded the election of General Jose Hilario Lopez. He took power in 1849, launched major reforms, abolishing slavery and the death penalty, providing freedom of the press and religion. The result in turmoil in Colombia lasted four decades. 1851 to 1885, the country was ravaged by four general civil wars and 50 local revolutions. So he started out with some really good things, but eventually the reactionists, and then they couldn't get along with each other for about four decades. So it didn't really help Colombia slash New Granada and Brazil. The Praia Revolt a movement in the Pernambuco <laughs> lasted from November 1848 to the 1852. Unresolved conflicts left over from the period of the Regency and the local resistance to the consolidation of the Brazilian Empire that had been proclaimed in 1822 
helped to plant the seeds of the revolution. So it got to Colombia, it got to Brazil, and it even got to uh, uh, Chile. So they said that these seeds of the Chilean thing actually came from this uh, the 1848, the springtime of nations. So what had started the springtime of nations, it was Karl Marx's Communist Manifesto. He said, hey, we the workers of the people deserve freedom and let's be free. And then all of a sudden, all you know, France, Italy, Germany, um, uh, uh, maybe Britain, I'm not for sure, I forget, but the, uh, all the way, 50 different countries, all the way, including to Brazil and Colombia and Chile, you know, they, they had different revolutions spread throughout everywhere, so the ideas were spreading, um, the Haitian Revolution, that was actually uh, the French Revolution's ideas, you know, the, uh, the, the leader of the Haitian, Toussaint Louverture, the leader of the Haitian Revolution, had heard all the French ideas about how we should decide for ourselves what we want out of the, you know, um, um, out of this world, and so that we the people should rule, and therefore the Toussaint Louverture said, yeah, why are we listening to these damned French people and these Spanish, and so the Haitian people rose up in rebellion, and become one of the very few slave um, rebellions that actually were successful, and they created their own country, so that is the best type of re revolution ever, you know, the it is the biggest, like, I don't know, Paula Freire, and some of these other ones, Desmond Tutu say that the biggest challenge for the oppressed is to liberate the themselves and the oppressor. One way to liberate both of them is just to wipe out the oppressor. If you just wipe out all the French, uh, uh, you know, occupiers who are using violence in order to enslave the Haitian people, if you just kill every single one of them, then there's no single occupying oppressor to live to carry out the genocide and the horrible things that they had done. So that's one way to liberate them. That's not exactly uh, Nelson Mandela's way, but it was Toussaint Louverture's way. And so that's incredible, okay, so, you know, I agree with it, disagree with it, however you want to put it, but it's a clear-cut change from one period to the next period, so it's definitely a revolution, and the bloodiness actually, um, you know, if you're like a person who defends white people, no matter what, probably would scare the crap out of you, because they killed every single French person, nobody would live after the Haitian Revolution, so it's just a black republic for black people, it's solely fubu, and they said that we're together, and then they said that we're not slaves anymore. So it was the slave people pulling in Amistad, actually rebelling and joining together. So the solidarity was there for the entire country. And then eventually they established a lot of civil rights and human rights um, and, and started being more friendly with the world. But that's how they began. And in some respects, I think they needed that space in order to, a lot of the South uh, Asian countries, the Tigers, you have the Koreas and Taiwan, a lot of these like strong um uh, even Vietnam, even like a lot of the Asian countries, they'll, they'll basically be isolationist and they'll build up their own industries and then eventually they'll come roaring back because they had been able to build up their infrastructure enough to where they were competitive on the world scene. And so that's the Asian Tigers, how they had actually become stronger was by becoming, um, you know, stronger for themselves and then once they were strong then they could display that strength everywhere. The 1851 Chilean Revolution was an attempt to overthrow the conservative government by the Chilean uh, liberals. So the liberals tried to overthrow the, you know, overthrow the conservative government. Albeit rooted in domestic power struggles among the elite, the revolution was inspired by the European revolutions of 1848. The successful anti-government uprisings in September in various cities, except the capital, Santiago, left the country divided in a civil war developed after battles and sieges by late December 1851, government forces had subdued the revolutionaries. So the Chilean revolution that was inspired by the springtime of nations also failed too. But Chile, Chile was, uh, I mean, they, they, they having protests right now that's in the street. They're protesting the student debt. I'm seeing them. I don't know if any of my American people are seeing them, but they're out in the streets. And uh, for the 30 years, ever since Allende, uh, Salvador Allende had been assassinated in 1973 by the CIA, he was a socialist elected that was his crime was become was being a socialist who was elected by his own people. So Hugo Chavez committed that same crime, and the government tried to U.S. government tried to wipe him out. The CIA did. They did it to Salvador Allende. Uh, they said that it was a suicide, but that's clearly you know uh, made up. And even if it was, they had broke. You know, they created the elements which would have caused the suicide. But I don't believe them. I think that's just a way to sort of say he wasn't a man and that he just give up on his own life. He just got scared with the overwhelming force and tried to make themselves look good. They surrounded his entire basement and he just said, I'm just going to kill myself. No, I don't believe that at all. Um, so they killed him, okay, and they did that in the next 30 years. Kissinger said that they was going to have, it was a shock 
therapy. So they was going to uh, make the, the Chile's economy scream. And so for 30 years, they had dictators that was pressing down capitalism, right, down their throats. And supposedly Chile is a great example of how capitalism has survived and worked for the region. And we should all do what the Chileans are doing if we actually, you know. Um, I don't know if I believe that or not. If that's true, if there is a justification for capitalism, that's okay because I'm a mixed... I'm, I'm, a, I'm a mixist. <laughs> I believe in a mixture of capitalism and socialism. Communism is pure, perfect socialism, so I don't believe in communism. I don't believe in any of the way communism has been implemented throughout the years. Um, the idea of a perfect social government, I don't know what that looks like. I think a combination of social uh, safety net and capitalism um, is necessary for a society to, to work. And so I, I believe I, I take the best of sort of the both worlds out there. Um, we should care about each other and each other's life, but we're, we're each other's keeper, but at the same time responsible for ourselves, and we need to make sure that we take care of our own selves. Self-interest is a very, um, you know, convincing sort of trait to go after. Being greedy and selfish, taking everybody's stuff, that's no good. So I think if we can just keep it to self-interest, and to care of people. I think we can make a good balance and combination between two. We have basically two economic systems that the world has been fighting over. It's just a history of ideas. That's all it is. And, um, and so I think we can take a little bit of column A and a little bit of column B and then make a little bit of column C. I don't see um, socialism and capitalism being fundamentally opposed. In fact, I see in America we've had socialism and capitalism for many years. We've had a social mixed system for many years. What do you think uh, Social Security is? I mean, the fact that old people get a pension just for working for five years, that you're taking all that money from young people. Young workers are paying into that, and you're getting, it's going right into your pockets. And, um, and the government's been using Social Security as a way to, like, balance their own budget. So, actually, they've been pulling a bunch of whole, um, you know, accounting tricks, and they've been using your pension plans as a way to ensure some of their other sort of riskier trade. And so, basically, they've been playing with your all's money, and eventually they've, they might get it from you, just like George Collins says. If we don't allow Obama, uh, the, sort of the health care go through, if they undo Obamacare, then they could probably undo the entire social fabric of everything that is America, civil rights, um, every bit of it. And just make it an anarchist society and just give it to the corporations and let them carve up the entire country. <sighs> Things that capitalism uh, does not help with, pollution, poverty, in fact, even like war and crime. Capitalism, they want that stuff to happen because if you have war and crime, then you're going to need someone who will have to build the guns and build the new buildings and have to, you know, bury the dead and, uh, and do all these things. And so that creates jobs. So capitalism actually doesn't make any moral judgment for anything. It just doesn't create jobs. Does pe can people make money doing this? And if it's business, then in the, all in the cost of progress and business, who gives a fuck, right? So that's capitalism. They don't care. take care of pollution. They don't care. take care of poverty um, or war or disease or famine and a lot of other things, the health of the nation. So there's uh, some things that shouldn't be for profit, and, um, and those are, that's the reason why you need enough socialism in there so that way you don't have... Because, I mean, seriously, if the corporate, big, rich, wealthy people are doing whatever they want to do and nobody puts a check on them, of course they're going to do things that's, like, in their interest and not in the community's interest. But if you have a government that puts them in check, which is the definition of FDRs stopping a fascism, fascism is when the government controls the government like a tool, and um, democracy is when the people control the government. And right now, the people don't control the government. So that's sort of actually uh, uh, Ron Paul and them's argument is that we got to get rid of the corporate control of government. we got to get rid of government because the corporations control government and therefore just have a big free-for-all. And even though they're totally right, they're actually speaking in language that makes more sense or they're more honest to the current you know, way things are being run. That would benefit the rich people because they are, have been able to run roughshod over all of us anyways. So it almost seems as if we need a active working class movement where we all can band together and survive even if it all does collapse, which doesn't seem to be possible. I think a more likely uh, avenue is that the um, the state is taken, uh, you get people who are elected into the state or you change the constitution. I think those are, are easier way to kind of change the, the way the system works. So anyways... Um, yeah, so see, the 1848 revolutions, they had messed it up because the intellectuals couldn't tap into uh, the working class values. That's exactly what I felt. I felt like their arguments were sort of lofty. While I agree with a lot of the things, white male privilege and, um, 
that's really the only argument that I think was intellectual. But I think that they it felt like it was they were the ones being racist instead of like basically I accept your argument. Now what? Well, you're supposed to get mad, and since you didn't get mad, I don't know what else to say. Well, so your point was to piss me off. Why would you just piss me off because of the way I look? And yeah, that's ultimately what it was. And so that's unfortunate that basically their definition to stop racism and institutional racism be racist themselves and to hurt their allies. Well, that's horrible and stupid and ridiculous, and any poor mixed interracial community or people know that that's horseshit, and, um, and that we're in it together. So, you know, just because, what, just, you know, two out of five whites are going into jail, and three out of five blacks, just because a higher percentage is being bad, that doesn't mean my shit sandwich is a shit sandwich, and so is your shit sandwich, just because yours is a little bit shittier, like, that's incredible. That makes no sense at all. So, um, and at that time, my God, I would have done... I don't know. I would have been a black revolutionary all the way to the very end if I would have been able to get, you know, sort of my foot in the door. And now I'm more of a measured approach where, okay, there's bad people in all groups and we all just got to sort of figure out how to get along. So before I was just on a, you know, hate whitey binge and black people are the answer, black power for everybody, black power, black power, black power. And I still have a lot of those uh, 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 fundamental sort of uh, uh, motivations and philosophies. But... Um, it's more, like I said, a measured approach. So, you know, I, white people haven't robbed me. I'm not afraid that white people are going to rob me when they have enough. I don't know. I, I, I got robbed, you know, by black dudes when I was in West End, and I moved to this trailer park here, which I haven't got robbed. And um, and I wonder if, you know, the race has something to do with it. And, um, yeah. So springtime of nations, this is 55. I wonder how long I'm actually allowed to do these. Because I haven't even got to the, the land reform. It is the Homestead Act of 1862. And I really want to break this down. So I'm going to do it in the next video because this is such a long video. But this was all about, you know, the, uh, the Mexican Revolution and the 1848 revolutions. And a little bit about Occupy and a little bit about how I think about some things. Okay, so...